Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Love Fruit podcast. If you'd like to keep up to date with the podcast and get regular updates, you can go to fruitfest.co.uk, sign up for our newsletter there. And you can also find us on YouTube and other places. So thank you for joining us today. Our guest today is Jonas Callowert um, Hello. From, from the USA. And Jonas is quite an interesting story that I wanted to share and wanted to learn more about, really. But um, the, the way that I came across Jonas and probably familiar to many people is from his many contributions to online forums, in particular 30 Bananas a Day, which he was a big, um, big contributor to and a lot of other Facebook forums. And I would say, Jonas, you've been a little bit infamous for the way that you've uh, <laughs> stayed in some of your ideas and thoughts. Um, so, but it's all, it's all good. Uh, yeah, so is it, would you like to introduce yourself a little bit to us? Yeah, that's a, that's a good one. Sometimes when I, when I hear the word from, I think, I don't know if I really have a from, but you know, the USA, because the USA is so divided right now, you know, like I could say, I live in Phoenix, but I, when I say from, some people say, where are you from? And I think, hmm, that's a good question. Maybe I don't have a from. I have a, I'm where I'm born in Charlottesville. I'm a citizen of Belgium and USA. And I was raised mostly outside Santa Fe. I grew up somewhat in Philadelphia and I moved back to Santa Fe and I went to school in Phoenix. And then I tried to move to Los Angeles and I came back to Phoenix. But yeah, where I'm from, like, but it's a good history because my mom ran away from Philadelphia because she didn't want to live in a dirty city and she didn't want to be, you know, having a lot of kids and be crowded. And she came from Belgium, which is very crowded. And, you know, it's some pretty, there's some authentic, you know, Phoenix is very pretty, but um, she, had digestion issues, the Belgian diet. I don't know, you maybe know, Europeans don't eat the healthiest, you know, they'll, they'll eat whatever they can, you know, whatever you find and they'll struggle. And this tribe wants growing land here and that tribe wants grains here and potatoes there, whatever food is able to grow in those climate and region. And so, so people ate and she had a horrible digestion and irritable bowel syndrome and stuff like that. And so she, my father had found in Turkey, um, Victor, well, not Victor Skovinskis, but um, one of his students of Victor Skovinskis and Anne Wigmore were named um, Stephen Haas and Ellen Haas, and they were teaching health food and raw foods. And they told him about eating watermelon rind juice and how that would help him with his dysentery. And he did that. And he told my mom about that because he met them before he met my mom. And my mom remembered that, and she went out and sought out these people, Stephen and Ellen Haas, who ran a place called Temple Beautiful in Philadelphia, which is like a raw food school or cafe or restaurant. And um, that place eventually burned down, but she had left before that happened to go to some vegan Tennessee farm to have me, but she didn't make it and had me in Virginia but then proceeded the rest of her way to go plant trees in the gold mine areas where the Don Diego and Coronado and different gold, you know, Spanish pioneers had came to look for gold. Uh -huh. So she planted a lot of trees in that area. So I grew up kind of off grid, buckets of figs, buckets of dates, making my own almond milk every morning. And, um, you know, doing that when you get involved in, public school when you're done with Montessori and the little private preschool stuff they you know get you into this program where they try to do all these weird things to kids they try to grind their teeth and give them vaccinations and many things that the school system and government has programmed and planned for children in America which I had exemption forms for so I became aware all of a sudden of all these things that were being done to my peers and that I was exempt from because of religious exemption, which was really more, you know, they call it Christian science, the people who get to be exempt from vaccinations. But I think anybody can say I'm religiously disagreeing with something and religion can be anything you want it to be. You can say I have my own new religion and I'm a Scientologist or I have my own new religion and I'm a 
Seventh Day Adventist. And Seventh Day Adventists are one of those raw food people. We did a raw food potluck here in Phoenix. I've been going to this raw food potluck since the year 2000, and it's a monthly event. And I swear they're like on their 280th potluck right now or something. And we just had one a few Saturdays ago. And it's good. It's a little gourmet, you know. And, you know, as I was going to one of them, it's called The Loving Hut. I don't know if you've heard of The Loving Hut or The Vegetarian. Absolutely. And I know the sort of story behind it with the Supreme Master and all that stuff. Yeah, the Supreme Master, Ching Hai. She thinks she's the reincarnation of Buddha and stuff like that. And, you know, she meditates. She's got a huge following. She's got a TV station. And I was there eating and I was like, there was a raw food cafe chef named Jeff. And I was like, why aren't you eating anything? He's like, well, there's nothing I can eat here. And I'm like, what do you mean there's nothing you can eat? And even the tomatoes they have was cooked, you know? They make a fresh orange juice that's pretty good. But other than that, there's nothing. Everything fake soy this, fake soy that. And, and then, uh, so I went home immediately and I Googled it because he had dropped Mike Arnstein's name and he had dropped, dropped Doug Graham's name. And so I went home and I ordered the 80 10 10 diet book from Amazon and you know little did I know it was coming from uh someone we're probably both familiar with Matt Monarch who was selling the 801010 book at the lowest price and he oh, would really? slip he slipped in a Xerox handwritten letter saying don't follow this book and everything is wrong in this or whatever he wait, said wait, wait, so, so, wait seriously yeah this is all right. Matt Monarch, we already know he's going to be a little bit of a shyster. You know, he's trying to sell stuff and, you know, be against it, you know, hygiene. And... He was selling the book, but he had a letter in it saying, don't follow this book. Yeah, totally. And now we know Matt Monarch is like broken veganism, I believe, even. Like, um, I think someone told me that recently. He's gone off the rail some other way. But I don't follow him that much. So I just, back in the day, he was, back when Doug, Harley Johnstone and 30 Bananas a Day and Freely, Leanne Ratcliffe or all these people were, you know, trying to pick up, everybody's trying to start something new. I mean, back when the first fruit Woodstock happened, you know, when people were together, there was the guy doing all the body weight exercises and sure. there, there was, I'm sure Mike Velocity was there and Ted Carr was there. A lot of the, the original group, I guess I could call it of the 2008 group, group that got together and 2011 was the first year. 2011, okay. Yeah. Those were those were good times. Huh? It was like you said, it was a little bit of controversy because everybody was kind of new to learning it. And some people can be a little bit more. The the faster I dug into it, because when I ordered that what, book, but what what year was that that you got into? In 2008, 2009. Yeah, so around a bit when it was first published. It was like it was um Thanksgiving. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh -huh of that year so it's like we don't call it thanksgiving we call it thanks living you know because we want to like there's like a kind of a vegan movement here a lot of people in direct action everywhere a lot of people doing animal rights stuff a lot of people they want to meet up and you know stand up we did a ton of circus protests and stuff and actually the circus no longer happens here so that's good mm -hmm. so, yeah so um you got the book, but just to just to go over your childhood a little bit, your your parents or your mom was actually already into raw food and the whole concept. So you were sort of brought up in that idea. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, sure was. Yeah, that was it was fun. She was like big in the wheatgrass. She was one of the Ann Wigmore, you know, the they made wheatgrass shot, put them in their eyes and you know, take yeah. shot of wheatgrass. And Doug Graham calls it protoplasmic poison or a stimulant. And the whole concept of stimulation really became more prominent to me because when they you know when you order something on amazon they say well you like this you maybe will like this too and they offered me a herward carrington book and it's called the diet of man or something and it was a good mm -hmm. book and i was like, wow this had a lot of articles from like um isaac jennings and russell thatcher trawl and sylvester graham and articles talking about stimulation and how we want to avoid stimulation and want to move towards temperance and like not getting you know diluted or poisoned and and yeah causing yeah. our excitement because then we'll be equally depressed for how much we excite ourselves so what was your diet like throughout your childhood then a lot of almonds i mean me and my mom used to make these like raisins and walnuts and ginger and stuff like that and roll them into balls and sell those sometimes date 
sometimes coconut, you know, flakes and meat, um, lots of greens. We did a lot of growing our own greens. And, you know, as I moved into school, I know things changed because my mom had difficulty when I was around first grade raising me with money and funding. So she sent me to live with someone who she met at that um, Hippocrates Health Center in Boston. And her name, she was an ex-nun. Her name is Pauline. But she, she wasn't doing the raw food anymore. She was doing um, what's called macrobiotic. You probably heard of macrobiotic. A lot of rice, and su- you know, like sure. su- nori and plum sauce and stuff like that. So she had left me there. So a lot of miso soup, stuff like that. And so I'd be trans. I transitioned more into that. And she was no longer even vegan. So she thought made me think when I was like up to third grade, I thought I invented double cheese pizza, pizza Hut or something, you know, because, <laughs> you know, how stimulating cheese is with the opioids and the gluten and a lot of those things make us crave it. And, mm-hmm. you know, so, you know, I kind of lost that way there then, but I came back to the whole vegan concept and with um, these Rastas, you know, white Rastas from, they have the dreadlocks, but they don't have, you know, they're not melanin. So they, <laughs> so they, they believe in this, the Rastafarian culture and Rastafarian has this thing called Ital Vital, which is pretty much like natural hygiene, just looking towards nature and, sure. you know, giving, you know, respect towards the different principles of air and water and, you know, living foods. And there's like Aris Latham is a guy who's kind of down there mm-hmm. doing that, I would say, you know, the um, sun-fired food or whatever he would call it. And so that was cool. So they told me when I was 15, go vegan when you're 20. And so I, they showed me a movie, Blood of the Beast, which is a horrible black and white movie of like a horse slaughterhouse in France. You know, you, you see the horse, they, they rip the skin off the face and the muscles of the face move for hours and hours after they do that. And then they showed me another movie called The Story of O, which is a movie about Wasti, France. It's like a horrible place where women get beaten and tortured and trained. And then she becomes a person who tortures and dom- dominates and trains other women. And it was like, they kind of made the point that domestication is phallic. Why are humans involved with the breeding and the controlling and the sexuality of other species? That's really not our business. Are these, kind of, um, are these French films? Yeah, they're both French films. Yeah. So you, you can speak French? Uh, I know a little French. I don't know enough French, but they're oh, translated. Okay. Oh, okay, okay. I've never heard yeah, the films. It's like, interesting. Like, I took French in junior high and I know Belgium is half French speaking. So I, but my family's on the, the Flemish, the Dutch side. Right. Okay. And I tried very hard to learn Dutch. So I know a little bit more Dutch. I took German class. I took French class, but my dad sure. learned Arabic in the Navy. So he's actually a translator for Arabic. Nice. Just like, like, so um, you, let's continue on from there. So you were vegan kind of in your twenties. Yeah. On my 20th birthday, I remembered that I told them that, or they told me that make that promise and that was my last cheese sandwich and I was like I had like Munster American provolone and Swiss all on one sandwich because I in Philadelphia they had this thing called the cheese steak hoagie and since I was vegetarian I never ate steak so I just always make this thing called the Philly um hoagie the cheese hoagie or whatever it was called but but um yeah so I was I was eating those yeah, and, and that was it. That was that was my last at Porta Sub. That was my last with my coworkers at this architecture company I was working with. And then I that was it. From that day on, I was always buying fake cheeses and like um, fake meats and seitan and te- tofu and tempeh and the stuff that existed back then because they didn't have what's called um, what's Beyond Meat or Impossible Whopper. Or, mm-hmm. I, and um, what was that? The um, the BK veggie was, you know, it's got eggs and whey in it, so it wasn't vegan. So I was like, oh, BK veggie's off the list. And the Veggie Max patty does that same thing. But I heard that now that BK Burger King has doing the Impossible Whopper, they don't have the BK veggie anymore. And Subway is doing soon this thing called this Beyond Meatballs. And even Dunkin' Donuts is doing the Beyond Patty and Carl's Jr. or Hardee's. I don't, you might, don't know who those are, but they're just like fast food restaurants. So everybody's getting on board now with this virtual fake meat, you know, like trying to capitalize on making meat out of peas, coconut, and um, what's the other thing, beets, I guess, or soybeans. 
Right. So, and you, you went to this potluck, you got the book. What was your first impression of the book when you read the 8 to 10, 10 diet? Were you pretty receptive to, or did you resist it? Oh first? yeah. It was great. I was like, wow, this book is great. Cause I knew about, um, what is it? David Wolf's like triangle book or whatever it's called. And the nuts, the greens and the fruit or his full concept. The sun, sun food diet success system. Yeah, diet success system. Exactly. And, um, so I knew about that, but I also knew that he was kind of like a shyster trying to sell like, you know, sunshine and grounding and just all these, you know, conspiracy theory concepts as, you know, marketing principles or the best day ever. And I was already into general semantics. So I'm, when I heard words like the best or yeah. the worst, none or every, I'm like, wait a minute, I need specifics. You know, like you ask questions to get more accurate when you hear absolutes. Otherwise, you know that it could be breaking reason and logic from this um, Alfred Korzybski, um general semantic, non-Aristotelian thinking. I've, all, I've always been very existential, like growing up. And when I learned things, like, I was like, wow, I really resonate with this nonviolent communication system, or I really resonate with this, you know, Nietzsche or Kant or Hegel or whatever it could be, you know, as far as Max Stirner and all the or people who had ideas and concepts to bring forth, like Spooner and mm -hmm. the whole concept. You, um, yeah, you're very into the communication side of things and how you, this is what made it difficult, I think, for people to understand you because you seem to have your own language system that you've, that when, yeah. you, when you write, not so much when you talk, but when you write, yeah. sometimes say things that uh, it's hard to fathom what you're yeah. saying. Yeah, like I took out the verb to be in that book, um, just told. <laughs> Simply Told or whatever it was called. I rewrote that whole book. And it's kind of like, I found all these really cool books. So as soon as I found that the Natural Food of Man book from Carrington, and then I kept finding more books. So I got this, um, My God Heals Does Yours by um, Edwards, I guess. And then I got a lot of other books from like yeah, this is This is quite an interesting topic because I think that you seem to have a really good understanding of the history of this the movement of natural hygiene and everything so for you can you give us a kind of rundown of where where's your head at with it like when did where did it start how did it get to where it is okay we can go way back to the beginning let's say that pythagoras was traveling through the middle east and trying to learn things from carthage and civilizations that no longer exist and you know he came across the egyptians and the egyptians had these people called the oracle the delphis the delphis were a group of women who were very powerful in Egypt. And I don't know, maybe they built the pyramids, but they were the Egyptians, from what I learned, when you look in Wikipedia and the history books, you find there's these people called the Pelasgians, and they lived in an area of Greece, and they were very much into living foods and vegetarianism and trying to be healthy. And like this knowledge, I feel like is intuitive to most species, like birds know how to live, animals, like wild animals, they know what to do to survive. Whereas humans, we maybe have lost our way. So maybe we've started writing stuff down and the Egyptians have documented this stuff and kind of put it into a system. And what they told Pythagoras was just follow nature. And that's kind of to the concept of what the bear is doing when it's hibernating or what an animal does when it breaks its leg. It really just has to lay there and sip water and fast, mm -hmm. go into a fasting state. And so kind of they, the Greeks discovered, rediscovered fasting kind of by accident by building these temples towards gods, like the god of Saturn, the god of Venus, the god of Pluto, all these different gods they gave names for, the god for this disease, the god for that disease, or just like, you know, Hygiena, the goddess of um, this, or the, there's different temples where they do this thing called temple rest. And so by going to different temples for different problems, they found resolution to some of their problems. And I guess that got carried on. And, and in the 1820s in America, this guy named Isaac Jennings, and around at the same time, this guy in Germany named Vincent Priesnitz, who was a priest who was kind of questioning things, and Isaac Jennings also was a priest who was kind of questioning things. They're kind of, kind of what's transcendental is the term, where they're taking more analogy from their learnings and teachings and kind of translating it. And I guess Isaac Jennings found this information from Pythagoreanism because a lot of the founding fathers like Benjamin Franklin were doing this fruitarianism ideas because the Pythagoreans in Italy were doing not just studying of truth and philosophy and giving equal rights to men and women 
but were, you know, having a, a really interesting concept where the outer circle didn't speak and the inner circle didn't own possession possessions. And I guess they had tons of grapes, and figs. And, talk about that. Talk about so, that. What are you talking about there? The Pythagoreans? Pythagoreans, yeah, like a philosophy group. They were seeking truth. They're mathematicoi, I'm, they might have called themselves. And they were, you know, there was nine of these schools I heard throughout the Mediterranean. And a lot of um, the Roman Empire, I guess, had, or the empires in that didn't like Pythagoras. And I heard he was 99 and really fit. And he was actually assassinated somehow or had died. How, how good do you think the, the historical factual nature of that all stuff is? Do you think it's pretty, pretty oh, yeah. strong? They, some, or? some people say it could be all made up and there could really have never been a Pythagoras and it could just be a concept, you know, to kind of carry on the idea. It's like, that's, I think that's likelihood too. Because a lot of the esteemed gospels that we found that are like all the books that have been taken out of the Bible and those kind of things, they have historical precedents like, Acharya S or DM Murdoch and have done all these studying of like the similarities of different cultures and mythology and people learning about, you know, North symbols or South symbols, stars. And you know, a lot of that Pythagoras stuff was mapping of the constellations and making up of astrology as a concept for entertainment, I feel like. And it's, you know, not only to keep track of the movement of the planets, but also to give meaning and purpose and, you know, Mm -hmm. people have to talk about but so isaac jennings had two other colleagues that russell russell thatcher trawl and sylvester graham who was more of a carpet bagger kind of a guy who was also an ex-priest traveling the country but thatcher trawl gave this speech before the smithsonian called hygiene versus medicine where he was really talking about all these laws of nature and concepts because what isaac jennings did is he was giving people placebos giving fake medicine of like colored food coloring to people in in just a pill that had no purpose no it didn't do anything to anybody and they would tell them don't eat any food just sip water take this pill and if you have the same problem come back again and we'll just do it again and, and he'd do that for 20 days and he never told people what he was doing and when he finally did tell people what he's doing they kind of tarred and feathered him they kind of like you're that's blasphemous. <laughs> so he was, fa he, was fa he was fasting people, but he was pretending, he was making them think he was giving them medicine, but he was just giving a placebo and telling them to fast, essentially. Totally. Yeah, and so he, um, he found a lot of success, though, and he wrote a book called The Tree of Life. I actually have that book in it. Isaac it's Jennings? Isaac Jennings, yeah. What era would that be? What kind of timeline do you think that was? 1700s or...? 1840 something okay because okay. he told about this idea in 1820s was when the concept came to him but then he didn't publish his book until 20 years later so he had a few other books too and i've really enjoyed reading some of that stuff it's hard to read because they speak an older kind of english language mm -hmm. yeah or f's or s's stuff like that but um but this, you know it's interesting and it's really mind-blowing to like learn this because then it goes from person to person and then there's this guy named um John Henry Tilden, who had, they started these things called sanitariums, where a sanitarium was kind of like a spa where you would go to do what Florence Nightingale did for the Revolutionary War, just get people in sunshine, fresh air, and some water. And that was the best healing that came about because of I, obeying the principles of nature, not poisoning people. And people already knew about these concepts from early on. So they, a lot of the medical concepts from early on, even from Hippocrates on have been poisoning people, have been bleeding people and blistering people and using leeches and just all these concepts are very barbaric, you know? Mm -hmm. Or like. And so, yeah, absolutely. So you were talking about the lecture you gave, medicine versus hygiene. Um, so Tilden mm -hmm. was the next one after, the, after him? Yeah, so after. Um, um, Troll gave his speech. They said half the country turned into more. There was more than 50% of the hospitals were sanitarium rather than medical hospitals because people were really into the concept in the 1850s and the, the food combining chart and physiology school started all that. So John Henry Tilden was the next guy who came in the next generation and he was gave a job to a guy as his magazine publisher. He published in Colorado. He had his school for fasting. 
he published a magazine called Hygiene Times or something like the Hygiene Review. And he had um, a guy who worked for him, who came to work for him named Herbert Shelton. Herbert Shelton was this amazing publisher. And, you know, there's guys between that, like a guy um, I'd say who can't be forgotten about was um, Herbert, I mean, um, Barnard McFadden, who was a publisher as well, who was a really big into bodybuilding and weightlifting and physical culture. Called it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, the, and as you yeah, were saying, so they, I, they were all, they all had sanitariums or fasting centers. They were publishing a lot. That was how they reached their audience, I suppose, at the time was through magazines, newsletters, things like that. Totally. And, and, and they were giving lectures back in the day. I mean, more of a lecture circuit. When the American Natural Hygiene Society started, I'm not 100% sure, but I know when it ended in 1998, and I heard there was a dispute between the cooking and the non-cooking people. It's 1998? 1998, I heard. That was the last year of the ANH. There's still a thing called an INHS, but I think that's just a website, and it's a Facebook group, which someone made me an admin of. And I, I like having the admin power in there, because of um, who else? The fasting guy, uh, Lauren Lockman, has admin in there, too, and he's been a kind of really cool guy as far as talking and running a large fasting center and you know I went to True North and I saw their fasting center and you know people aren't eating raw there but they like the concept of raw and they want to learn more about raw and the ideas in their mind but they're in the more in the no sugar no oil no salt idea and right you know the vermin and you know what's the other guy um from the movie Fork Over Knives, Campbell, yeah, and then McDowell, McDougal, and yeah, those guys. Yeah, yeah. So um, here's the one thing I want to ask ask you about. You've read these books. You've read these old books. They're full of wisdom. They're full of great ideas. But my impression is that none of the, a lot of these guys believed in a natural diet, believed in a raw food diet, but very few of them actually stuck with a raw food diet or or even had a diet that people could do and could enjoy would you am i right about that or am i wrong i just feel I like there was, there was a time when they had this thing called they called it brawn food brawn i don't know if you've heard of the you ever seen the movie it's called um um uh Road to Wellville or something like that. It's Matthew Brodson, Broderick, Matthew Broderick, right? And he's an actor and he's in this movie called Road to Wellville. And it's all about um, Kellogg, John Henry Kellogg. Right. You heard? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. He's at the sanitarium. And, you know, they weren't, you know, they had, they had some funny concepts. They're more maybe into anal washing, which is called colonics and stuff like that. Like um, they call it the water, water cleaning therapy or they had another word for it. But there's a lot of times I feel like there's upgrades that people have made. So they thought at this time brawn food, which was ground up grains, dry but raw. So they were eating raw grains and they knew which way to combine it, which way not to combine it. But I believe there was this guy in England named Burke, I believe, Burke. I have to look that up for sure, but uh -huh. he, was, he didn't really like the starch. He's like, we got to get away from this starchy foods with these lectins. And Doug Graham has written a great book about that called Grain Damage. Or um, and not uh -huh. that's not grain damage, but um, yeah, grain damage, called? grain yeah. damage, right? Think about yeah, starch solution, but yeah, that's a different book. <laughs> that's that's not solution so much. <laughs> I think it's starch pollution, but I'm like, no, no, <laughs> that's I'm right. Sure. I don't remember you saying that. <laughs> <My lips>. <laughs> <laughs> like I sing those McDougal songs about how he's like giving people insulin because he has to give them salt and sugar because if he doesn't give them that, they won't take his medicine. And I'm like, yeah, McDougal busted. <laughs> <But>, uh, <laughs> But, um, but yeah, there was, there was like, I feel like those people upgraded so they progressed by getting better. And so Doug Graham's book is in that progression of these next books. Like David Klein is another guy who made book like um, about um, what's that problem they have with the gut? That colitis and Crohn's. Colitis and Crohn's. Self-healing exactly. colitis and Crohn's. Yeah. Yeah. So that, I mean, that's, I've always thought that these guys, the, obviously fasted people they help people get well it was mostly a vegan diet although some of them at times were promoting like goat's milk and stuff and yeah goat's milk like walker walker's the goat's milk. my mom was one of the people who fell for the goat's milk thing with the walker 
And he said, but the book said they're the size of humans, so it's better for people. And she's big into make goat's cheese, but she didn't eat it, just sell it. My mom's a silly person. She'd do these things that were kind of sketchy, but then she wouldn't, she'd partake in them, but she wouldn't, part, you know, consume those things herself. Like, even like sauerkraut, she would make a lot of kimchi, but she doesn't eat it. She just sells it at the farmer's market kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so there was all that kind of stuff going on. Uh, but I don't really think, my perspective is that people thriving long-term on a raw vegan diet is mostly an ancient thing and a modern yeah. thing. Like, I don't, think, I don't think Herbert Shelton and a bunch of these guys were consistently raw for years. Yeah, they went into milk a bunch. And the same with um, Barnard McFadden. He would, promoted some milk in his book a little bit too. So. Sure, sure. So um, give us some ideas of, what you've talked about some of the books you've read what would you say are some of the important books if you if people want to read through the very the simple and easy was that my god heals does yours book that book was very like every chapter says the same thing it's very short very concise that was a beautiful book anything by uh, that oh. nathan the guy nathan the last name of it is uh who it's I, I wish I had see the problem is I have my library is now in my storage unit in my storage book and I'm living in this Volkswagen bus so I only have a few of my books out of storage here but in storage if I had my whole library there yeah that Doug book was very mind opening and as soon as like as soon as I got the 80 10 10 book I went to the Mexican market and I bought all of the fresh fruits and vegetables for like 30 bucks that were on sale and from that day on i was on a more than eight to ten year continuous raw vegan doing it fully raw like christina and her um her teacher john rose you know but he's more of a juice you know uh -huh. solid vacation guy but but yeah yeah, I wish Doug Graham's wife actually, Rosalind Groovin, her book was very good, actually. I have that in PDF, that book. She kind of retired, I suppose is the term. So she's not really active, but she did go to the Woodstock Fruit Festival and spoke, right? She was never at the Woodstock Festival. Um, uh, you, yeah. She had, not that she wasn't invited, but she had a strange issue with not being able to get into the US for a while. Yeah. Uh, for I some see. reason, or I don't know, her uh -huh. right, her right to go in the U.S. was stopped. But in the U.S., I, I was, never knew why. But it was a bit. I weird. was reading the description of the um, U.K. Fruit Fest group before I was in this blog, and I guess in there it said the different speakers, and I guess she was listed as one of the speakers for she, your she's UK. been Yeah, she's been at U.K. Fruit Fest. Yeah, most of the That's years. Cool. Yeah. Um. So. Do you like the Shelton books? I've never really read a lot of his books, but. I do like a lot of his books. I feel like they're really good. Like he was really all about it. Like he, you know, like I know that Nathaniel Pritikin was the guy that had the 95, 955, the 80, 10, 10 concept for athletes and cutting down protein to get higher performance with higher carbohydrates. And, but yeah, it's interesting because there is there is the natural hygiene side, and there's also the the sort of which is which was talking about a natural diet and fasting and raw, and there's the vegan or the plant maybe you call it plant based side or whatever, which was people starting to realize quite early on that a plant based diet was the ideal low fat plant based diet. So you had uh, various yeah. and this like the kind of scientific a bit more scientific well, side. The forks over knife crew they were like we got to yeah. cut the fat down to get the atherosclerosis down and the blood the white blood cells yeah yeah pretty can and that that's the kind of way it goes back um what do you think yeah. what do you think about arnold Errett? Did you, did you read his books arnold Errett, i feel like a lot of people give him more credit than he deserves i've read a lot of places that he was kind of like a dunce who just took <laughs> He is from other people, and then someone eventually dropped an anvil on his head off of a scaffolding. Jeez. And he thought everything was mucus. Mucus was the problem, but not recognizing what caused the mucus. So, like, more of the cause and effect wasn't really in his purview. And then another guy who's like that, that everybody gives a lot of credit to. What's that guy who's a um, black guy who died in prison? 
who a lot of people give a lot of credit to. So they say don't eat avocados because they're mucus forming. Oh, uh, Dr. Dr. Sebi? Sebi, yeah. Another one. Yeah, another one I don't like is Morse. And he's like selling, uh, he's selling um, antler or um, adrenal glands from animals. He's like, we'll kill a bunch of animals and we'll take all the adrenal, adrenaline gland out and we're going to make our adrenal formula. And he, he kind of, he's big into the fruit and he creates a lot of new fruitarians and a lot of people into natural hygiene. Definitely does, but then, yeah. But then he has, he's got this school and then people get the certification and they have like become teachers and all this stuff. But at the same time, that's not totally vegan and it's not totally a, like cleansed from the raw the herbs because he's big into the stimulants and the adrenals and i tried herbs a bunch and i was like yeah i didn't get the effect i want and i get the idea that if you poison yourself even with the lower level poisons you can suppress your symptoms a little bit but that doesn't really address the cause because the body's having those symptoms because it's a healing crisis like we're going through something to get rid of what is causing the problem and if we're just going to put low levels of you know you know strong herbs yeah, we can make ourselves less hungry and get into more of a fasting state, which is really kind of what's happening. But at the same time, he's like, he says, hygiene people are crazy the same way that I don't like another guy, Brian Clement. It's probably not a good idea to deal with dropping all these guys' names. But <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not a fan of them. It's not like people are going to be like, oh, you're going to go be the big fans of them because he doesn't. But he stole the Hippocrates Health Institute, I feel, from Ann Wigmore. And he's another guy who's like, oh, hygienists are just crazy. I wish they should all die. And I'm like, really? He said they should all die? <laughs> so, like, people have strong opinions, you know, and people around food. Like, it, people will bug me ever since growing up just because I don't eat meat. They're going to, like, poke and prod at me. Oh, won't you do this because of that? Or why don't you do this? Or would you do it if you this? Or, and I'm like, no, it's really just not in not my plan i don't want to do that and um if you don't want to do it don't do it because my mom always tells me don't tell people what to do just let them ask you let them come to you and ask you if they want to you know know something but but most people aren't really asking genuine questions they're more asking you know in instigation questions <laughs> yeah um the so what do you think about the more modern so you get up to herbert shelton i think he died in about late 70s um and you know by that point well and truly the medical system had completely dominated oh yeah uh, it shut him down shut his schools down tc fry was his student the guy that doug graham learned from and tc fry read a wrote a great book called the 101 lessons of the life science health system and that book there's swayze foster is actually selling that book and profiteering off of it and made a website off of it and it's good for reference I really like that book for reference, but Swayze Foster went and left us in our raw foods and she made some good videos and then all, so did Nick Akato made great videos and then they burned us. And I'm like, what are you guys are supporting us, promoting us and creating a great platform. And then all of a sudden you're burning your platform down and changing your message to try to coach people in a, or torture yourself by being a feeder <laughs> or a feeder. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. yeah. They, well, they, they, both, they both managed to develop a much bigger audience from uh, not being raw vegans than yeah. raw vegans. I think that's, money. Yeah, a lot of people do that. Oh, they want the money. They're after the money. It's like an artist who sells out. I'm not going to stay underground. I'm going to go mainstream. It's like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I hear you. Um, so TC Fry, uh, but you're coming up to like it feels like there was quite a big a big movement in maybe the 90s or something with, with raw food becoming a bit of a big thing um you had david wolf you had guys like that mm -hmm. um and you had what's that guy in california the sister of um of marcus rothpants um julia giuliano giuliano's sister yeah tar what's her name uh oh. yeah, I, I can't remember her name i know who you're talking about yeah, yeah, but she they're making videos together. They're not the most hygienic and you know, but they did inspire a lot of people and he does make his consistent positive message. Yeah. In, you know. Oh yeah, he's great. Yeah. So you've you've been raw eight or nine years and it mm -hmm. sounds it sounds like you just basically read the book and you stuck with it since then. Is that how it yeah, was? The minute I read it and the minute the first day I got all those vegetables and fruit 
And I started following the, you know, making the meal plans and saying, oh, wow. And like, I looked at chronometer. Chronometer was one of the biggest advantages because when you put a thousand calories of any fruit in chronometer, you look at the vitamin and mineral content, amino acid content of it. And you're like, wow, this is hitting every target. I'm higher than I need to be in every range. And even when I had an accident and I went to the hospital and they said, wow, your blood and yours are so high. How did you do this? And then they said, wow, that's the power of fruit. And they knew that the doctors acknowledged to me that they knew that fruit was very, you know, something the body could use to heal and become better. And, but they said, no one is going to listen to us say this. So we have to take shortcuts, meaning poison people with medicine. And they said that right on my bedside. And I was like, oh, okay. I hear you guys. That's, that's your message. <laughs> and then, oh my gosh, I don't know. I want to get a little, a little nasty or raunchy here, but they were saying, well, how did you get your B12 so high? And I have all these B12 videos I've made, like taking videos of like B12 from different people who said things about the intrinsic factor and, and, you know, the different sources of vegetarian sources of B12. And one of those is an article from the a Navy guy named Cohen, who says that um, people who have a healthy sex life don't have low B12 and saying that the fluids from men and women have 40 times more B12 than our intrinsic factor of our blood. <laughs> so I told that to the doctors and I'm saying, yeah, why don't you just recycle? And then you'll see B12 go up. <laughs> I don't know if they took it serious or if they felt like they could tell that to someone else or something. Interesting. But <laughs> Interesting. Some people think my video is a little bit over the top, but whatever. <laughs> So your transition to raw was, did you have any struggles with it? Did you, or did you find no, it? I, was, I, I didn't even have a transition. I just went zero day. The day one, I never looked back until about 10 years late, 10 years. Cause I was like, oh man, I'm going to try this. They wanted me to, these medical doctors wouldn't leave me alone after I, someone tried to kill me. And that's a different story, but I had all these ribs of metal plates on them and um, all my lung was collapsed. And so they were giving me these blood tests and all this different stuff. And they said, oh, your iron's a little bit low. It wasn't out of range. And they said, well, get your iron up and do take an iron supplement. And I was like, I won't do that. I'm, I don't take supplements. I'm not going to take those. And they wanted to take a vitamin D. And I said, well, I'll show you how to get my vitamin D up. I ride my bike around. A lot of food I deliver is vegan, but <laughs> a lot of food is, a lot of people pay. I feel like there's a misanthropic culture. Like people are very, there's a lot of people who are very anti-people, like people who don't like people and people who don't like themselves. Which, and so they, you know, and people who are stimulated by very innervating food. And so, yeah, they're gonna pay. And a lot of people are very lazy and they won't even pick up their food. So they'll pay people like me or Mark Tasty or other raw people I know who actually ride bikes too and deliver food as a form of employment. And so, yeah, I would um, bring this food to people, but but yeah, and have enough food. And you know, I just had enough energy. I just had tons of energy. I was hydrated. I had enough food and just keep doing. Oh, so yeah, I was curious so when they said my iron was a little low. I said, well, I can show you how to get my vitamin D up and how to get my iron up. So I even got, got out in the sun, rode the bike shirtless a lot. And I got a really good tan. Even my mom says, I've never seen you so tan. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I get it. Sun is good. Sun makes you feel happy. Sun gives you vitamin D. And I got my vitamin D higher than the range. And they're like, never mind about the supplement. And then as far as the iron, I just went and ate some whole beans. I said, okay, I know that Pythagoras said no beans, this and that, but I'm a break raw. I'll eat the iron, I'll eat the beans. And I, and now I wish I would have just eaten a bunch of cilantro or parsley instead and just try to show them that. But that's a lot of parsley, you know, like there's not many calories in, in lettuce, sure. that stuff. So you'd have to eat like 30 heads of lettuce, just like you'd have to eat 30 bananas to get the, the caloric density mm -hmm. that you might need and your stomach is going to fit that and so so i just show them that and i got it up and so when i did that i figure well, i might as well now that i'm eating some beans i might as well eat some beyond meat and try the diet cheese and try the impossible offer and so i've tried these different things and i'm not impressed you know they digest okay and they make you stink though that you know you're gonna have a like onion you have onion arm pepper you know har armpit i mean <laughs> And you're going to have, you know, there's MSG, they call it heme. Heme is like a yeast they grow and they kill and they make it into like a, that's the meat flavoring supposedly. Right, for the, right. Weird. So there's creative things and they've got the marketplace covered and there's tons of stuff and they want to go into McDonald's with the McPlant and want to go into Taco Bell and they're already in Del Taco with their Beyond, you know, Beyond Tacos and 
So I, you know, I've tried it, but then I'm very happy to go back to fresh fruit and raw. And then, you know, I will compromise sometimes to introduce someone new and say, well, yeah, this is better. Try this other version or why don't you eat some of this? That, so you know, are you raw now? Are you raw at the moment or are you, you back and forth? I am raw at the moment, but I have had a last meal that wasn't maybe in the last month. So, yeah, sure, but sure. I'm eating raw and I know the difference in digestion and hydration. And, and so what, what is your raw diet? What does it look like when you when you do eat raw? Well, uh, I mostly go to, again, I still stick with what I originally did. I, you know, here we have like in Arizona, we have unlimited citrus. So we have oranges, grapefruits, tangelos, pomelos, lemons, tangerines, mandarins, and all this stuff on these trees from like November until even September, or like almost every month except one, actually. I mean, you know, half the year, mostly the summer months. But then the other stuff, you know, like I always like the idea of, of I'm going to decide what I'm going to eat. I'm going to put acid and a fat together. I'm going to put a sub acid and an acid together. I'm going to put a sweet and a sub acid together. So I kind of like try to get enough to have three meals worth of food to prepare on a ripening rack. And, you know, papaya is always going to be like two pounds for 88 cents. So I can. I always got to like, they got to smell good. I won't buy them if I don't smell good. That's huge. And then, and then coconuts, we got the dry coconuts, the fresh coconuts and the Thai coconuts. And those will be like, you know, you get those for a dollar fifty a piece. And so I get a lot of coconuts and I like making coconut, like coconut and melon are the fastest digesting. I always go for what digests faster first. So what's going to be sweet. And I'm climbing date palms. I have freezers outside full of date palms dates like black sphinx and hyani and different fresh dates i found these fresh dates here in phoenix and i started climbing the palm trees mm -hmm. i said this is untapped gold mine like no one else is doing this this is totally neglected there's pomegranates that people neglect here the citrus that people neglect there's um all the cactus fruits that i've been eating i make prickly pear maybe the season's like almost over like next week but there's two seasons the middle of summer and the middle of winter two harvests like on equinox so all these cactus everywhere outside the city they're like red and beautiful and they taste sweeter than strawberries sometimes and then you know of course you can get mangoes at the all the tropical stuff that comes in and then of course honeydews and then like you get the little mangoes five for a dollar this week on the altalfo wow that's the, good they're not ripe sometimes you gotta wait three weeks till they get wrinkly and they smell good or they taste good but then of course bananas bananas and pineapples and i always like to make sauces with bell peppers and tomatoes and so it's just very simple i try to keep it very simple you know but i like to experiment a little bit so i i'm not scared to break the food combining rules sometimes and at the same time i'm aware of what i have to do if i break rules you know by eating a lot more lettuce the next day or eating a lot more greens and i know originally i was kind of i stayed away from turmeric and ginger realizing i don't need something anti-inflammatory but then i also realized if i'm having something anti-inflammatory it's not hurting me and it adds a little bit of dynamic to my sauces so i've been enjoying sure. that and uh, i i don't know if you want to talk about this i think you had a problem with your daughter or something do you want to mention oh my that? yeah that was horrible um i have a son named isaiah and he was I met this girl named Sonia Simmons at this raw food cafe called Rossum at this um, co-op called Gentle Strength Co-op where I was actually a board of director. I had ran for election and I got elected and it was very tumultuous. There was like indemnity and in the red and like they're mismanaging their money and you know, it was going to go out of business and they had to move locations and Whole Foods was going to buy the building and build like they built like a 10 story Whole Foods there now. And that co-op moved and they micromanaged to death. But I met this girl there and I was so entranced. I was like, wow, who's this pretty girl with these beautiful eyes? And she's in this raw food restaurant. And, oh, is she's vegan probably and this and that. And I made a I, you know, I, I saw her there and then I saw her at a poetry thing and I saw her at something else and then we hung out and 
I got her to hang out with me, but then I couldn't, <laughs> I don't know. And things, one thing led to another <laughs> and then she ran away. And I tried to bring my mom to her house to meet her and say, oh, this is girl. And, and she's really beautiful. And I thought I liked her, but she didn't, she locked the door. Well, eventually she, her mom turned, her own mother turned her in to this thing called child protective services, which comes and takes children from people who aren't taking care of their children the way that the government wants them to. And so I went to court and tried to help her get that kid back. I never had a knowledge and I didn't know this kid. She ran away before he was born, much like my own mother did. So I met him when he was three years old at a raw food potluck. She came to the raw food potluck on the street that I'm on actually now, Moreland. And it's a beautiful little pink house. And it's, I know the guy who lives there. He's not doing the raw food anymore. But, um, And I have another friend who lives one south of him. She's really nice. And um, she's really interested in the raw food salads I'm making her. But uh, eventually, I went and met him every week, 45 minutes. And I guess the people at the government workers they didn't like the food I was bringing. I was just bringing different types of food to see what he might be interested in, this fruit or that fruit. And they made these rules. Like you can only bring a pear, an apple and a banana, nothing else. And like, and they say, you're not giving him enough protein. That's a potential for neglect. And we're going to terminate your rights and go to court against you. After they told me they're going to reunite me. And then they changed their mind and said, they're going to terminate my rights because I'm not eating meat. And I fought all the way to the Supreme Court of Arizona and I appealed and I lost. And even the lawyer that they assigned me was against me. It was really just horrible. I was like, how do I, I had Karen Ramsey helping me. She wrote these great papers. I had that guy, um, oh, what's his name? Not, what's Doug Graham's other friend in California he used to work with? Uh, his name is on the top of my tongue. MFA Trader or something like that? Or? Tim Trader, that's right. Tim Trader wrote me a letter for the court as well. So Tim Trader and Karen Ramsey were backing me up in court, but that only the court only had a more biased opinion, honestly, of me and our lifestyle and everything I was doing and it wouldn't even give me a chance. And it turned out that it was the people who adopted the kid had adopted other children of this girl I knew. I didn't know she even had those children. I didn't know how old she was until I married her, actually. I was like, whoa, she's like 10 years older than me, 11 years older than me. <laughs> but, you know, but... um. Yeah, but she turned out she wasn't even really raw either. Someone saw her eating a cheese quesadilla driving her old car and her car's not very clean and full of trash. And I tried to help her and she wouldn't let me help her. So I, I could do it. And I hope one day that this adopted child of mine comes out of the woodwork and he has the rights to find me if he wants to from the adoption agency. So when he's 18 as an adult, he's allowed to know who I am. But I wish I would have won and I wish I could have been a single father if I, I tried, but I didn't. Well, that's a shame, man. It is. Yeah, so the system was against you. Yeah, pretty sad. It's hard to find people like, you know, I'm glad that there's raw food potlucks. I'm glad there's a meetup group where we can meet up. And even if everybody's not on the low fat page or everybody's not on the no, you know, no salt page, no oil page or no vinegar page, they're still there and they still have an idea. But I, it's kind of sad that there is the division there because you can make a fruit luck and those people aren't going to come to your fruit luck, but you will still go to their. Yeah. Rob. Well, you, yeah, this is def. I mean, you, you came across a lot online that you were very strict hygiene and you were always, it's, it sounded like you were criticizing people that included spices, salt or whatever in their, in their, in their diet, but especially things like spices which you were very against, or herbs or whatever. But it's yeah. how, I don't, don't know how you were, how much you were genuinely against it, or, or that was just, it came across everything that is, way. Herb could be everything. Every plant could be called an herb we want. So mm -hmm. even the fruit come from an herb plant. But yeah, I feel like I was just maybe being more, less than critical. I was being more kind of explaining the reasons that natural hygiene or people would have said, we don't do these things because of the volatile oils and the ass, the free acids is what I was learning into, was the different things. There's non-free acids like citric acid and there's free acids like malic acid and carbonic acid, just things that our body, I guess when it's, there's things that are mineral element compounds that are organic and inorganic. And the way it was explained to me is like, 
sodium is like a jumper. It can jump to sodium chloride or sodium potassium, sodium, so it can make partners with different things. And so these different things, when they get denatured by heat, they become non-useful to us. So a lot of the things, we have the middleman of the plant. We need the plant to take the minerals from inorganic state in the soil, to put them into the cells of the plant. And then when we eat those plant cells in their ripe, assimilable state, we are able to get those organic mineral element compounds. And there's seven of them, you know, fluoride, chloride, sodium, potassium, chloride, you know, hydrogen, you know, potassium, all these mineral elements that are building up the cellular or cells or chemistry. So it was kind of cool to hang out with a bioorganic chemist for like a year to get a lot of insight into that. I already was good with chemistry and physics, but, you know, having someone who's even educated in it from a college PhD level was really helpful. Yeah, absolutely. So um, what would be basically your advice for people who are trying this lifestyle or who are getting into it? What, what would, how would you sort of encourage them? I, I like the concept of like, um, go all in and don't look back. But I also say, get enough, don't fail. You know, like knowing that, you, knowing that you're getting enough calories is a big deal. Like sure, people, a lot of, I've seen a lot of memes that say, oh, don't worry about counting calories when you're eating fruit. But you know, I, or don't worry about calories in general, but knowing how many calories are in things, kind of like research, being well read and researching and knowing are more about physiology and what having enough around because a lot of things aren't going to be ripe when you buy them. You can't just go to the store and buy what you want to eat unless it's like an avocado or a tomato or a lemon mostly. And those are easy to eat. And I'm glad we have these Mexican food restaurants, like kind of making a list of what are your sources, like what farmer's markets, what larger supermarkets that are for discount, what sale days you have. Like we have Wednesday sale days, things go on deep sales on Wednesdays. And that, without Wednesdays, it'd be really hard to survive in this lifestyle affordably. And, you know, the local foraging, knowing what grows around you locally, maybe even doing your own gardening and planting. Like, like even Mike Velocity, what he's growing pawpaw inside if he had to, right? Pawpaw fruit. Yeah, that's another thing is you, you do a lot of foraging and you're able yeah. to do a lot of foraging in Arizona. What's that? Uh, you live in Arizona still? Is it that? Yeah, I'm in, yep. That's what, where I'm at. So what's it like there? I've known a lot of people that have been raw vegans that have moved there or li live there now. Um, is it a good place for people who are interested in raw food? Oh yeah, Dustin came out here and me and the transitioning breatharian, um, Jeffrey Bernstein, we took him to the or <laughs> where the oranges are. Orange, orange juice. Yeah, orange, orange juice, the transitioning breatharian. Mm -hmm. We took him out to the <laughs> Valencia Park in Mesa where there's all these oranges. Like they have in the streets in Mesa, there's a certain area where the streets are double lined in citrus. So it's all public and you can just go picking oranges and grapefruits and citrus all over. And he actually made a business out of it and sold some of that citrus on the internet before he moved back to Sacramento, I believe. With um, Yeah, that was, that was a guy who's, for some reason, yeah. his name on Facebook was Orange Orange Juice. And yeah. Yeah. He, was always, he was always saying that everyone should try and transition to like 900 calories a day of juice. He's got MS. So he's got, his MS, he says because of his disease that he has, that he has to eat only one or three meals a week and he's moving it down. But at the same time, yeah, he not eating all raw, right? But he's, uh, but he yeah, that's, what you that, were, that's what you were telling me that he was, he was, he was saying that he was doing that and then doing something else as is so often the case with people online claiming extreme things. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's like, you know, yeah, it's like, He's trying to say he's going to eventually eat nothing. And these breatharians, who's another breatharian? What's that guy's name he, that he learned from? He's got the tattoos on his face and he's black. Genesis Sunfire? That's right, Genesis Sunfire. That's who he said he learned from. Yeah. 
<laughs> but you know, like like you said, there's no evidence to them saying that. But I get it, prana, and I get it. The body can heal itself, and the body can eat itself. Anabolism and catabolism. We're creating new cells and we're burning new cells. So we're constantly recycling our own bodily cells. So we yeah. are very efficient and it's more knowledge and there's more intelligence to our body than we may ever know. And we know a lot and we continually know more. And maybe it, we're going to turn ourselves into a cyborg and that might be a disadvantage as well as an advantage sometimes. But, but yeah. I, I like the concept of prana or chi, but I think it's a completely mis mistaken idea to try and substitute them for food. Yeah, because then you're not going to have energy. Because like, it's really important that I learned when you sleep, the quality of your rest determines the amount of your energy for the next day. Mm -hmm. So if you got it well in the day, sleep well that day you ate, and then your next day's energy, the glycogen has loaded into your cells in your state of rest for the next day's use. Yeah. There's a number of people that have kind of argued with you over the years. Um, yeah. Supplements. What you've got? What's your view on supplements? And I think you used to get. I mean, I've had yeah. debates with different people about supplements as well. But what what is your take on it? I feel like a lot of them are analogs. A lot of supplements are denatured. A lot of things that people want to make, like green powders, for instance. I'm saying, you've kind of semi heated and cooked that, and you've denatured it a little bit and it's not as optimal there might be a little bit of absorption of nutrients that are useful there but the quality of those nutrients i feel like i had doug graham respond to me on this once in on a video he made a video that was really good and i remastered it and it was really an important video i feel like because doug broke it down really well about supplementation and the reason we want our things from whole plant food in you know when they come attached with what they would have been formed and put together with like the fiber is even so important like our microbiome the same microbiome they say lives in the soil lives in our gut and that microbiome breaks their food is fiber so if we're not eating a good amount of fiber we're not feeding our immune system basically and that's what like 80 10 10 book makes it very clear we're eating orange juice with pulp we're not pulp free orange juice because we want that fiber and we're not making many other juices. I mean, I mm -hmm. maybe make pomegranate juice or prickly pear juice, but other than that, citrus is the only thing I would juice. Yeah, yeah. So what, 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 what's your lifestyle like at the moment? You say you're living in the van? I'm living in this van, yeah. It's kind of a, it's, it's all right. You know, I had an Airbnb that I was running and then the Airbnb got sold and I kind of felt burned about all that, but I'm letting it go. And it's like, that whoever bought that house got a great deal. <laughs> but um, yeah, but this van, I'm rebuilding the motor for it. So the, it'll run soon. I have a Volkswagen bug, that's a 59 bug that I do drive, but I don't drive it that much other than to pick up food and to forage because I ride my bicycle to earn other than selling the fruit that I sell to, you know, just riding my bicycle around the downtown area on post basis. De delivery, right, right, cool delivery on me on uber eats there's a lot of good vegan restaurants like i deliver a lot of smoothies and i get free game i i don't try to do anything offensive to the people who i order from or i deliver to but everyone in between just say anything you want honestly you know to inspire people to like care more about themselves or to think healthily or whatever yeah. it but it's good if people wanted to interact with you more do you have are you is there any forums that you're active on or any place that they can follow you a little bit or anything? I'm currently banned from, on Facebook because Facebook is so ban everybody 30 days for saying anything that's not community standards based. And then, you know, Facebook is really not happy about anybody not agreeing with the vaccination sales. So and obviously I'm on the outs for that. And so, but um, but Instagram on Jonas Sunshine, one word, and is, uh, I, I post all my images there. And I guess Facebook and Instagram's messenger is somehow merging now. So like that. That's sunshine sunshine's your actual middle name isn't it yeah that's because of the pythagoreanism the sunshine air water rest and poise that make up the pentagram and the pentagram is made from the 16 golden triangles there's 16 triples triangles that have whole numbers like three four five but there's like other ones and they add up to 16 of them and you add them all together and they form the, the star the, the star forms out of that it was very, like very cool man is there anything that we've not talked about you'd like to sort of share about or 
cool. I don't know. I, I'm having fun with your Friday things. I just, I missed last Friday, but that, that's yeah. been fun. Yeah, it has. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we're, we're going to keep that going. It's pretty good. Uh, cool. Yeah, I mean, I just appreciate, I, I, I think you're someone that's always been, you know, so many people, I've had conversations about you with people that like, um, that either you criticize or whatever on a forum or something, and it's it, you became like this almost, yeah, uh, character. I don't know. It was like like everyone could like loads of people knew who you were. You were just the yeah. most. You were the most. It seemed like you were the most extreme. Like, oh no, I, hi, I had hygiene number, hygiene freak, but I had number that, one on thirty. I think you really like that. I had number one on thirty bad, and when. Freely and Durian Rider transitioned to Raw Till 4 or whatever, and all those people gained weight and like kind of messed up. Because just like Doug says, when you mix complex and simple carbohydrates together, it's like TNT. It's going to create a reaction in your body, and your body is going to develop a lot of white blood cells to be like, whoa, safer, safer. And, uh, and so like they banned me because I wouldn't give them their approval for their cookery at the time, I guess. And they threw me out of Raw Till and 30 Bennett as a day. And um, basically, was, everyone, everyone got banned from Thirty Bananas a Day at one point. Uh, like yeah, they, were, they were like assault everybody. They're like, out of here! If you don't agree with us, you're gone. If you don't have the same kind of we have, yeah. you're gone. If you don't do methamphetamine pills to bike up the doy, you're gone. You know, okay. <laughs> that was bad when they came out when the when they came out and outed each other for drugs. That was the end of them. They're not as popular as they were after methamphetamine these, pills. Yeah, they said we do methamphetamine to get up the doy faster. Who, and then they when said, did, when, when did they specifically say that about themselves though? I'll send you the link to the video. Actually, it's a, yeah. And then but then they were saying Durian said Freely was doing Botox injections, and then Freely said Durian was doing steroids. And then they were like, Oh, okay, we're all we're outed. Then Freely was saying, telling him, Don't sleep with 15-year-old girls anymore. You gotta be careful. But now he's got that girl as his girlfriend, so. Yeah, I don't. I wouldn't say he was sleeping with fifteen-year-old girls, but um, younger women, I guess. Um, yeah. So, but that's the funny thing about that website is that they they would kind of talk about how they got banned from websites and stuff and forums, but they banned everyone from <laughs> that website. Like everyone got. They wanted to control. They wanted to control the scene, obviously, right? And they and they tried to do so many things. Even remember when they came to Woodstock and they tried to make the the sugar video, and then John Kohler immediately made the sugar reaction video to them and had them banned from Woodstock. What do you think about that? Because I, um, I mean, I personally, I don't think sugar is a part of a truly healthy diet, but. Yeah. I really don't think it's anywhere near the problem that people think sugar is. Depends so, on the heat you get it to. Like my mom had three rules growing up. No sugar, no refined sugar, no meat, no TV. Because she wanted to keep away from the advertisement. You know, that, that's the whole reason they even exist, actually, these people we're talking about, is because they're trying to make money off of selling ads. So they're trying to exploit people in order to make, you know, money. Yeah, 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 yeah. But so but the sugar, when you heat sugar, like when I learned acrylamide in 2002, the acrylamide study from Sweden, it shows how when you heat a potato to a French fry, you get 300 parts per million acrylamide. But when water, I had my godmother, that Pauline lady, she was an OSHA, federal OSHA. I mean, they, they go to like Occupational Safety Hazard Association. They go to factories and corporations yeah. and they test their like poisonous chemicals and regulations. And so she was showing me that 0 0.03 parts per million is the standard in regulation. Like anything over that is carcinogenic and dangerous. So 0 0.03 versus 300 parts per million, that's just off the chart. And so I started looking into that and saying anything, and even Starbucks and things in California put this acrylamide warning on their products. And so when I realized that, and I had a secretary at my work who was gluten intolerant, if she even had one bite of bread, she'd be out of commission, have to go home for days and, and couldn't come to work. And so I started saying, I'm gonna not have gluten. I'm gonna avoid things that are overheated by baking and frying. And I called myself boilatarian at the time is in order to avoid these heated things. And I knew that when you heat sugar, like the way you make sugar, there's different types of sugar. Like if I just got carob pods off the trees around here and I just smash them up with a hammer, 
grind them with the coffee grinder and make them into a sugar, that's a granulated sugar that I didn't have to go through the heating process of sugar cane or high fructose corn syrup, which is even worse, what they do to genetically modify corn to make it into like the number one sweetener that most people are drinking with oil in a drink, causing themselves instant diabetes. Like look at a Coca-Cola's ingredients. That's just the ingredients for diabetes. <laughs> mm. um, yeah, so, uh, well, thank you for, thank you for coming on the podcast. You, you've got a lot of interest. So what, what, you talking about a acrylamide, acrylamide, what are some of the other things that you would, what are some of the other reasons to be raw and to not eat cooked food? Well, it's to avoid the mucus. I feel like the best reason is the endurance. The lack of body odor is amazing. When I started saying, wow, my poop doesn't stink. Like, I like that. I was like, this is cool. I can go to the bathroom so much easier. The city that like it's just so neat, much more, more enjoyable. And what are the things that are going to inspire people? Like what to make just even the effort to make a try one day, one, one meal, even maybe third day challenge is cool. But you know to. Pause a moment if it seems like your um your connection wasn't so good there. Just just give it a second. I think it's I okay. Um could you repeat some of that? Feel like you... the uncanny... This is you don't want to lose oh cool. I was just yeah, I was just yeah. saying that it's like that it's you don't want to lose the uncanny abilities. You don't want to lose the ease of digestion. You don't want to lose like the mucus, like just not having eye boogers. Like I remember I always had rub my eye when I wake up in the morning. I'd get a little crusty booger out of my eye. And I not having that is a huge benefit, I feel like. Not having the mucus, being able to breathe easier. Like mm. I was taking garlic. I thought garlic was my only medicine. And it turned out that garlic it breaks down mucus great and makes it you can breathe but it, it's not the answer it was only when i stopped doing things like garlic that i didn't have the problem that i used the garlic for which i thought was interesting well thank you very much for joining us today jonas um you, you've Welcome. been a very interesting guest and i'm sure there's more to learn from you uh, how would people connect with you again on facebook mostly Instagram, yeah just jonas sunshine yeah, Jonas Sunshine on Instagram or Facebook is just Jonas Sunshine Collawort. And then I guess um, I did try to play with the Minds platform, which is also Jonas Sunshine, because they actually pay you for your content. Like Facebook is making money off of you by the same ad selling ads, you know, selling you ads, selling your friends ads. But um, Minds actually lets you be part of that process and make cryptocurrency that you can turn into actual money. Minds.com. But then also, what is the other? I guess my email, Jonas with one, two, three, four, five mixed into it. So J102N3A4S5 at Gmail. But okay. Well, thanks for joining us today, everyone. Thanks for watching, listening. Feel free to comment, share, subscribe to the YouTube if you're there, or, or um, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes or Spotify, whatever you're picking it up. Feel free to get in touch with us, info at fruitfest.co.uk with any questions. If you want to subscribe um, to learn more about online events, our festival, um, other education information, you can go to fruitfest.co.uk, sign up for the Love Fruit newsletter, the email newsletter that we put out weekly basis. And you'll also get notified about any upcoming episode of the Love Fruit podcast. Thanks for joining us today, Jonas. Any last so, words of wisdom to share? Just eat enough calories and um, do a little exercise. Make sure you get in the sun enough. Make it a little bit, at least five minutes. <laughs> and um, buy dates if you want them. Next year's harvest will be even bigger, hopefully. Thank you very much. And we'll see you all in the next episode of the Love Fruit Podcast.
Sweet. Thank you so much. Great day.